This time on Watchers of Tomorrow, get small with the Terratin Gang. Hello everyone, welcome to Watchers of Tomorrow, the sci-fi review and critique show where we put the humanities back into science fiction. My name is Gep, and I'm joined as always by my friend and co-host Dr. Izix. Hi! I think I messed up that intro a little bit, but I'm not re-recording it because this episode doesn't deserve it. <laughs> not at all. <laughs> I'm angry. So, uh, so uh, this, this is kind of a nothing episode. <laughs> Very nothing. And what, what gets me, like... It's a nothing episode that's just trying to be kind of funny, and it probably could have, but it doesn't really lean into either direction. Yes. It's like, well, there's this kind of amusing situation that's happening, but we're not going to really uh, treat it as either serious or silly, so... Yeah, they're not doing anything. It's awful. Oh my god. So this this episode is called The Terratin Incident, and in my experience, any episode that ends with incident is awful they didn't know what they were doing it's just like i don't know it's a thing that happened near this place well i kind of like the enterprise incident but you know your mileage, <laughs> mileage can vary so <laughs> everything is the enterprise incident it's an incident that happened near the enterprise <laughs> yes <laughs> no, uh, what ugh, about the andorian is... incident oh yeah the andorian it happened near an andorian <laughs> <laughs> in a different enterprise <laughs> So this was written by uh, Paul Sch- uh, Schilder? Uh, Sch- Schneider. Schneider. <laughs> this was written by Paul Schneider, which is a name I can't pronounce, um, mm-hmm. who previously did Balance of Terror Indeed. and Squire of Gothos, which were two pretty decent episodes. Indeed. And, and so we were kind of maybe expecting uh, that quality here, but uh, not really. But no. <laughs> <laughs> I, I I think this might also be another case where the episode suffers because it's only a half hour as opposed to yeah. full hour. Yeah, that they could, could be. Fill this out, then yeah, then maybe they could do a lot more with the concept. But as I guess is, it was just a problem yeah. with TV writing of the time because they don't pack in plot, so they need a lot more time to do nothing before they can get to plot points. Yes. <laughs> So if you're if you're not going to be doing anything for at least uh, the first fifteen minutes of your episode, uh, you, know, you kind of need a longer episode in order to get anywhere. I think this is right. I'm I'm bad at my film history. I think this is right around the transition when the French New Wave was starting to influence American cinema, and we were getting some actual editing. But it probably had not hit the cartoon world. <laughs> probably not. No. <laughs> Save us, France. So again, we don't have any actual guest stars, but there was just a fun note I found that. While there's no guest voices, several of the filmation artists drew themselves into the background characters of this episode. <laughs> well, uh, yeah, there's some crowd scenes here. So, yeah, that kind of uh, not surprised there. So they're just like there's a dude with glasses who's one of the like main producers. And there's this, this other guy who's one of the animation heads. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, we, we finally get to see a, a glimpse at the, uh, the the folks that are poorly animating our show. <laughs> yeah, and they, I don't know, they draw themselves better than anybody else. I guess because they don't have to move. Yes. Yeah, if you don't have to move, then you don't have to simplify things. I so. guess that's yeah. the thing. That's the problem with this entire thing. They got a bunch of artists, but no animators. Yeah, that kind of works, actually, because you know, their, their backgrounds tend to be fantastic. It just everything else, it's just... <laughs> <laughs> kind of loses something for the medium of animation. <laughs> yes. You know, maybe they should have just made a comic instead. <laughs> that would have been... I mean, some of these were turned into comics later. <laughs> some stuff was. Everyone forgets the animated series. Yes. So sad. But we did not. I mean, honestly, there's there's some better stuff in here than the original series, but I, I, will, I think the, the quality variation is more stark. Yes. Some episodes are like, oh, that was pretty good. And some are like, well, that's a thing that happened, I guess. All right, we should get going because this, I don't even know. I don't even know. Take it away, Gapwood. The Enterprise arrives at the remains of a supernova to map its progress for science reasons. Awesome. Uh, hey, I wonder if this is uh, going to be uh, co- comparing it to the data analysis done by a friend of mine in grad school who did this, uh, made this uh, really cool 3D model of a supernova sort of in progress. 
that like mapped out where the various different elements and things like that were going and how fast they're expanding. And it was a really kind of cool sort of uh, dynamics uh, thing. So I hope we get a lot of this this episode. That is neat. Though Uhura immediately picks up a radio transmission on the edges of their ability to pick up radio signals, I guess. It's hard to say, but the signal may be using an outdated radio code that hasn't been used in almost 200 years that only spells out the word Terratin twice and then shuts off. Well, that's a little weird. Um, I guess we're getting some uh, deep space signals from some planet, you know, uh, you know, a couple hundred uh, light years away, maybe? Yeah, might be random space radiation, junk, junk stuff, but... Yeah. Uh, Kirk believes it's enough to justify leaving this boring science mission that he didn't seem that excited about anyway and setting course for this new planet. Dang it, Kirk, I want to do some science. I don't know why they decided, like, you know, let's have them start doing science and then get bored and leave. <laughs> you know, because you know, the TNG era, there's plenty of like, yeah, we're on a routine mapping mission and then something weird happens on the ship. Um, but it's like they're still doing the mapping mission. <laughs> yeah, you assume there's some poor scientist somewhere going like, this is for my thesis. I don't care that the Borg are invading. <laughs> oh, uh, half the crew's been, uh, you know, you know, possessed by, you know, you know energy beings. I don't. I, could you leave me out of that? I got work to do. Come on. <laughs> it's like, yeah, Troy's been energy impregnated or something. I need to. Like, I've got tar- cartography to do. Yes. <laughs> That's but, uh, the entire. That's all the background characters on that show. <laughs> Just, that's why you never see anybody but the main crew, because the bridge crew, all this weird stuff's happening while everybody else is just doing their dang jobs. <laughs> that would explain a few things, yeah. <laughs> so they arrive at a volcanic crystalline planet with a breathable atmosphere. Nothing about this planet makes sense. It's a giant crystal with volcanoes and an atmosphere. Okay, um, I guess the oxygen envelope of it around this planet formed at some point independent of any sort of biosphere or anything else making sense but you know yeah yeah so okay here's my theory you wind up with like a mars situation where you had an active atmosphere that left Mm -hmm. but instead of it just you know distributing slowly off into space another planet like swings by and picks up the atmosphere that'd be hard to pull off this is the only way I can figure out these barren planets where you can breathe. Well, uh, there's also a supernova nearby, so maybe that had something to do with it, too. Oh, like yeah, all the oxygen went planet. that away. Yeah, yeah, it blew it off one planet onto another. Like, so as quick. soon as they arrive, <laughs> some sort of impulse passes through the ship. It apparently doesn't do anything, but it's weird. It also doesn't affect the sick bay lab animals that we now have. Because we got to have our canaries in the coal mine here yep. uh, because we're in space and we remember that that might be something useful here. We have see-through mice and a glowy fish. Yes. So uh, uh, mice without too much light and fish with too much. Okay. So if we got light problems, we can, uh, we can tell what's up. So as they enter orbit, we get to see a satellite dish on the planet that fires a bright beam at the ship, which impacts every crew member but seemingly doesn't do anything. Yeah, just everyone just looks like they're being beamed for a while and then it just stops. But it did destroy every dilithium crystal in the engines. Well, that sucks. Um, um, so are we stuck here forever now? Uh, oh, no. Is this the precursor to the burn? <laughs> so Spock analyzes the crystals and finds spiral fractures. Okay. It's important, What does I that guess. mean? Spirals. <laughs> Everything is spirals. Wait. Are, are, are we suddenly in Werewolf the Apocalypse and the, and the, and the evil werewolves are coming after us or something like that? Or is, is, I think that's the bad guys there, at least some of them. Is that they're spirals? Like they're, they're, they're like black spiral uh, werewolves or something like that. Maybe I'm thinking of someone else. So also Spock's posture may be bad, or Kirk, or everything's getting bigger, because now the engineer's tools are too big for them to use, and in the dining room, people are having trouble reaching the tables. Yeah, well, you don't need to eat anymore. Come on, guys. So probably the ship is expanding, or as Spock points out, the crew is shrinking. So, uh, which one is it, Spock? Uh, you're the smart guy around here. What's up? No one knows. I mean, it's about the same either way, but it's weird that they go with the ship is expanding for so long before they get to maybe we're shrinking. Yes. <laughs> well, with the, the ship expanding, the, the, you know, it's something you have to do to the entire ship. If it's us that are shrinking, that's maybe an easier problem. So things are pretty dire because the ship doesn't have enough power to leave orbit because everything's broken. Uh, they can't send out a distress signal because they don't have enough power for anything. So same problem. Uh, they can't replace most of the damaged components because they don't. all the crystals got broken. 
and they're still shrinking and fast approaching the point where they will no longer be able to operate the basic functions of the ship. So not only is the ship broken, but they're not going to be able to do anything about it soon. Because now they still have to jump into up and down on buttons to make them operate. And yes. <laughs> shenanigans where they're crawling around on control panels with ladders. There's a, a bit where it's like, all right, so you made these, these wooden stick ladders. Where'd you get the sticks? Yeah, why do they have wooden stick ladders? <laughs> Sulu and Ares are using their their consoles and standing on wooden stick flimsy ladders made of like sticks and rawhide. <laughs> it's like, do you just happen to have these around from the last you know uh, pre uh, warp uh, planet you visited and you just ran off with a bunch of their stuff? What's up? <laughs> so Sulu has the sudden angry urge to blow up something. Uh, he doesn't well, know what. And Kirk thinks it's a bad idea because they don't have anything to shoot at. Okay, so uh, we've got to have our, uh, our 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 forced drama for the episode here because we don't got anything else going on. Yeah, so Sulu is just angry. He wants to blow up things. And in his agitation, he trips on his own control dial and falls down and breaks his leg. Whoops. Hmm. Well, uh, this is kind of awkward. Uh, so I, I guess you were just as massive as you were before and you just kind of fell in a weird fashion and... Uh, It'd be kind of frightening when you think about it, because the gravity's the same, and now you're so small. Oh, yeah, what's the... Would you reach your... Well, I guess they said that they have the same mass. Yes. So it's like, literally, their structure is changing as opposed to their mass. So that means... Well, actually... So let's see. They said there's, this is going to be the most of the episode after this, because there's nothing to talk about except random physics. But just to think about, if their mass remained the same, but they got smaller, so their density increased... Wouldn't th that should instead of doing the normal thing where if you're much smaller and lighter, your um, your uh, maximum falling velocity would get lower. Mm -hmm. That would mean that it would get higher because you've maintained the same mass and therefore more density, but you have less surface area to impact the air. Exactly. So your terminal velocity would be faster. True, but uh, there isn't really enough time to get up to terminal velocity uh, given the distances involved. True. But I wonder if you would still fall faster <laughs> yeah, with less air there, resistance. There would, yeah, there would be a, a little bit of difference there, but not really uh, anything noticeable on this sort of time scales. So Kirk and Spock take Sulu to sick bay. They can't do much because all their equipment is made for normal-sized people. Uh, I think it's also should be pointed out that uh, this is still the Enterprise, and you do need to have your little twisty handle things for the turbo lifts. They just kind of ignore that. Yeah, they do. I was thinking about that. Because they make a point to say that they can't open the door because the little electric eye thingy that tells them someone's in front of the door is too high up. <laughs> but then I was thinking about the little twisty handle news too, yeah. Yeah, so uh, so how are we going to handle this next part? Um, maybe we just cut to the next seat and pretend it didn't happen. Stand on each other's shoulders. <laughs> and slowly turn the thing, Jake. The chapel has the idea that since they can't use the normal bone knitting stuff... They might be able to use the tiny one that's made for the super sh little bones in your inner ear. Oh, that's pretty clever, actually. So she climbs up on a giant shelf to grab the tiny laser, but then she trips and falls into the fish tank. Oh no, she's going to drown. All right, I want to be able to communicate this scene to y'all. <laughs> so I'm just going to read, I think not the description bit, but I'm going to read verbatim from the transcript, Chapel's lines. Go for it. The so chapel falls into the fish tank. Chapel. Help. 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 <laughs> At this point, Kirk runs up some chairs, gets next to the table on the fish tank. Nope, other way around. Gets next to the fish tank on the table. <laughs> Chapel. Help. 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 I assure you I'm bringing the same level of energy. <laughs> yes. Kirk grabs a needle that's on the table and throws it to her like a javelin and then uses the thread to pull her out of the fish tank, saving her. And she also has the mini laser, so they're able to uh, repair the leg. Yes. So, as a physicist, this entire scene was very cringeworthy for me. <laughs> do you want me to go through, through, through the why now or later? I guess later, because we aren't going to have a lot else to do. Okay. <laughs> But she's more dense. How does she float? Yes. That's the first problem. <laughs> <laughs> um, I forget at what point. 
they decide this, but they're in sick bay, so it was probably this. Um, the spiral dues, the spiral spiroid radiation is causing them to shrink because it's affecting only organic materials like the crew and the uniforms, which are apparently made of algae, which is interesting. Well, that's kind of cool. Yeah. But none of the metal junk, but also the dilithium. And they decide that because dilithium is so strong because it has a spiral cell structure, or not cell, spiral uh, molecular structure, apparently. So it got affected by the spiroid radiation. So I guess this does imply some things about the structure of dilithium that we should maybe remember in the long run. And also, humans have, you know, double helix DNA. That's like a spiral. So so the spirals affect spirals, which is why everything's shrinking. But they're maintaining the same mass because it's just the space between atoms getting closer together. I guess. Because that's how that works. They said there's as much relative distance between atoms as there is between stars and planets. Maybe when you're talking about, like, the nuclei there, but... uh... When you're actually talking about the, the extent of the, the electron cloud, things are a little bit you know more substantial than that. Yeah, we, we can talk about that too, but my understanding of how the atoms in something work is that the, the electromagnetic fields are basically abutting each other, and that's why mm-hmm. the whole thing holds together. Yes. <laughs> well, there's some uh, bits about quantum mechanics and uh, you know stable energy states as well, but you know. <laughs> that's quantum mechanics. As Feynman says, no one understands quantum mechanics. <laughs> Just kind of the point, actually. <laughs> now they're all shrinking. They're in super danger. Kirk decides that the only option is for him to beam down to the planet, try to figure out what's going on, and whatever's shrinking them before they all get too small to work the ship anymore. Well, this actually seems like a reasonable plan, um, which you kind of got, could, guys could have done that earlier. Yeah, before you were way too small. Yes. <laughs> so a team of engineers uses ropes and stuff to operate the transporter controls, which is kind of fun. Uh, they set it on a 10-minute auto return timer, which is I didn't know they had a camera timer on the transporter. Yeah. Well, that's kind of you know useful. I hope that comes up again sometime. Yeah. <laughs> so on the surface, Kirk is full size again, because apparently the transporter just fixes things. Uh, it's magic, you know. <laughs> Uh, so as soon as Kirk gets there, the spiroid radiation waves stop for some unknown reason. So he fixed it. Well, uh, I guess maybe the rival here, uh, disrupted the, uh, harmonic what's it of the planet. And so the, uh, this, this radiation wave has been disrupted and now you've solved the problem. You just have to wait until, uh, you get back on the ship and then you can, you know, start being people around and, uh, rescue the entire crew eventually. So you can find them. Now they just have to beam people up and down and be done. As soon as Kirk gets there, an eruption goes off and knocks him down. He drops his communicator into lava. His very small communicator, by the way. I forgot. They made him a tiny communicator to work with the tiny him, but then he became big him. It's like, well, this is now useless. (laughs) Kirk runs from the lava and stumbles onto a super tiny city. Oh, that's convenient. Uh, Now we have a place for all our super tiny crew members to live in. And then he's immediately beamed back up because it's been 10 minutes, apparently. Yeah, you gotta run around off screen for 10 minutes uh, while the uh, cl- timer clock counts down. So on the bridge, Kirk finds Scotty and some engineers. Very, very tiny Scotty. But the rest of the crew's gone. Dun, dun, dun. So uh, Spock and company are just kind of missing. All right. Um, Scotty says they were all beamed away by something. Uh, well, if you're so small and you can barely see each other at, at this range, you know, when Kirk is standing basically right next to you, How'd you know? (laughs) Spock could have been effectively miles away. Yeah, Spock's just on the other side of the room. (laughs) (laughs) So Kirk, being careful not to step on anyone, contacts the planet, uh, threatens to destroy the tiny city he found if they don't return his crew, and vaporizes a rock next to them to prove his point. Oh, well, that's very uh, very uh, uh, precise uh, shooting there. Uh, If you were just off slightly, you would have vaporized the entire city. Mendant, who's apparently the head of the city, responds. He's like, not sorry. <laughs> it was like, we don't apologize. We're proud. Also sorry. <laughs> so we're going to be as uh, obtuse about uh, everything for the time being, but also sorry. Um, also, uh, we're going to die here. Uh, but hey, we got, we got your crew here. They're cool. We're cool. Everybody's cool. How are you? Yeah. So the upshot here, the crew is down in the city. They just beamed them all down because they were tiny and the city's full of tiny people. Uh this, this planet 
is being threatened by volcanoes, but the volcanoes also knocked out their long range communications. So when the ship came by, they had to like send their emergency defense beam at them, which I guess shrinks people just to get their attention because they couldn't com- use their communication equipment. So that's kind of an obnoxious way to communicate and kind of begs the question that if your defense system is, I guess it makes sense that it's be more robust than any communication system. But if you're more likely to need your communication system in order to even uh, know if somebody is a hostile entity trying to do you harm, then why would you not have them be both about the same level of uh, robustness here? Yeah, no one has backups. Yeah. (laughs) Not even like an antenna. You can just stick up there, you know? So basically the upshot of everything here, this planet is actually an old Earth colony. Originally (laughs) named Terra 10. Well, that's kind of a lame name. 10th Terra. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> then eventually it became Terratin. The natural spiroid radiation of the planet shrunk all the original colonists who survived, built the city, and now 200 years later their descendants live there. Because they got tiny, the colony was forgotten and nobody from Earth ever found them again. Well, um, you probably should have, you know, let people know where you're going because the Enterprise is just like, yeah, this is just a random planet. We don't have any information about it. The, the bridge crew <laughs> is being back aboard with lots of dilithium. Also, they return to normal size because transporter. So now they yes. have dilithium to repair the ship. And uh, Kirk, for some reason, leaves the guy hanging for a bit. It's like, okay, we can leave. It's like, what about me and our city that's dying? Well, you're kind of a jerk face. So we're going to take a little while to build tension here artificially. So. But they wind up just transporting the entire city up to the ship and taking them to a new planet off screen. Yes. And the uh, they do not the, the people do not return to normal size because they've adapted to their genetics to be actually the size instead. Yeah, cuz that's how that works. We'll get that's the other thing we can talk about. <laughs> <laughs> that doesn't make any sense either. <laughs> yeah. There's no there's no social commentary. There's no moral dilemmas, there's no philosophy. Just a, a mystery and uh, bad physics. Yeah. So should we talk about how they got physics wrong first or how they got biology wrong first? Well, uh, let's, let's you know, physics is the one I'm more, more uh, accustomed with. So let's start there. Um, so yeah, what is you your, spiroid radiation? It's something that they made up for this episode. <laughs> so let's just assume that it works. It's some sort of crazy radiation that causes... Uh, spiral structures to tighten up so it you're basically like pulling a string and everything gets really much smaller or something like that i don't know um as everything gets nice and tight and so your s- structure of your you know various complicated uh, uh molecular uh structures uh gets smaller because reasons and so you have a situation where you have the same mass for uh, an individual has been shrunk, but at much reduced volume. So you are increasing your density uh, while not really changing much else about you. Which means you're going to be punching holes in the bottom of the ship eventually. Yes. <laughs> so there's this thing called uh, pressure, which is basically force per unit area. Uh, and so you, as a you know a, a person that lives on the Earth, uh, apply a certain amount of force in total upon the earth when you are on the surface of it. Uh, and this force is just enough to keep you from falling through the earth. Uh, you know, no more, no less. Uh, it is, you know, you already mentioned that there's sort of, you know, the repulsion forces of the uh, electromagnetic, uh, you know, portions of the, uh, the atoms there that keeps atoms from falling through each other. Um, and it just gets all nice and balanced. And there's maybe some wiggle room where things bounce there a little bit, but, you know, sort of ignoring that at a very, very minor effect, you're kind of just sort of, you know, equal and opposite sort of uh, forces going on here. And so that force is going to remain the same as your body shrinks, but the surface area is going to be reduced. And so the, you know, force per unit area increases and eventually that pressure is going to become so, so incredibly high that it might start causing the floor to buckle underneath you every time you take a step. And then eventually just collapse entirely. That's going to be fun. But they never account for the floor when they're doing <laughs> Star Trek things. They don't. They never it's... phase through the floor. Well, they never that one have time, trouble but... <laughs> with the floor. They're just, they're just 
you know, you just you just don't do anything to the floor. The floor is just the strongest part of the ship. I mean, maybe that graviton plating or whatever it is. Yeah, maybe it uh, keeps them perfectly on balance at the very surface of the floor somehow. Yeah, or that theory that the floors are actually made of like super dense star matter to equal the <laughs> density that would be necessary for Earth gravity is true. <laughs> yeah, our, uh, our our gravity plating is actually just neutron matter. It's fine. <laughs> <laughs> so so why is your ship not invincible? Well, they people keep coming at us from the side, so they shoot us through the windows. <laughs> <laughs> they came at us from above or below then we'd be fine <laughs> so why don't you just make the sides of your ship out of this stuff too we'll be stuck to the side of the ship then <laughs> <laughs> anywho uh you know speculation on that aside uh we, we still of course do not know the actual substance of the floors um but uh we'll maybe we could hand wave that it's some super strong material that doesn't bend easily there that also doesn't quite explain why Chapel is able to swim. <laughs> because she's still her same mass. She's just now a lot more dense. And so when you, you, you can put like a, uh, like a, like a one pound uh, paper boat on top of the water there and displaces a certain amount of, of water. And then it, you know, bounces out without the pressure of the, uh, the water and the, you know, the weight of the, the boat. Or you could put a one pound, uh, you know, uh, sphere of metal and it falls right in. Because there's that whole, you know, displacement thing going on there that is uh, not being quite handled well by the, uh, the, the the very small, dense object. So Chapel should actually just sort of fall to the bottom of the, uh, the fish tank there and uh, be underwater. Or she's actually just an incredibly strong swimmer, but she's just having trouble because of the density thing. <laughs> Alternatively, that's not water. It's like some sort of super mercury that's just also transparent <laughs> that's true it is for their weird alien fish so it's uh, some sort of super dense fluid that is just enough to let her swim in this particular situation i guess makes sense does but it requires these kind of things that it's like why would you ever have this on a spaceship <laughs> <laughs> it's like yes this is our fish tank it weighs five million tons uh and outweighs the rest of the ship here um so uh don't 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 tip it over please <laughs> <laughs> so uh we, we got that sort of little problem there uh so you also got things like the the string that kirk uses to pull her out have you ever been uh, picked up uh, full body wise uh, with just a little string like that no not a piece of thread it must be super space thread yeah, I guess it's uh, an unbreakable diamond tether, maybe, sort of situation. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> to pull in uh, some Futurama here. Uh, so, uh, you know, the, if that was just a normal piece of th uh, thread, uh, yeah, it basically, all right, so you grab it and you pull Kirk up about the same, uh, halfway up in the uh, the air there, and uh, Chapel's still drowning. So, meh. So, yeah, so, so this is just a few of the problems here. Then you have to think about... Okay, so they're still breathing oxygen, right? Yeah, I was wondering about that. <laughs> How is that working with their their lungs there at all? Because because so, the, the the oxygen atoms in the air around them aren't shrinking as well. Otherwise, there'd be other you know weird, weird effects going on. Um, also, would fit with their explanation of the whole spiralness because you know molecular o oxygen is just a couple pieces you know you know atoms of oxygen stuck together. And so you get a, a situation where there's these these atoms that are still quite small, of course, but now you're much less able to have the same amount in your physical lungs as you did before. So at some point, you're basically going to be gasping for air, and then later you're going to asphyxiate. Yeah. I mean, see, they they did this. I remember they've done this a couple times in uh, inner space. They addressed this problem, mm -hmm. which actually I need to add inner space to my sci-fi movie list. I forgot about inner space. It's on mine. <laughs> <laughs> so they did that in inner space. Like he can't get new air because he's tiny. Mm -hmm. And they did it in DS9 when they shrunk a shuttlecraft. Yes. This is not the first time we're gonna get small in the this is Star Trek here. <laughs> yep. So they they had this before. People don't think of air. People never think of the air. There is just this magical thing that just surrounds us, binds us, keeps us alive no matter what. Binds the universe together. So, uh, yeah. So 
yeah, they'll, they'll eventually be, uh, be unable to get enough oxygen into their lungs in order to maintain their bodies. Um, now, there is, you know, potentially a similar question with food, but, you know, this is such small time scales, you don't have to necessarily worry about that. Um, there is also that problem where your body's not entirely made out of DNA molecules. Hmm. <laughs> so there's like a lot of water in the human body. Like a fair bit of it, of your mass is actually water. And, and you know, you know it, it's very much a, a case of, all right, so your DNA is shrinking somehow. And you still have these water molecules that are just one oxygen and two hydrogen. And they're not maybe changing a little from this radiation, but they're not these long, uh, you know, uh, uh, strands of uh, uh, connected uh, atoms like that. They're just three atoms hanging out together. So there's only going to be so much shrinkage you can sort of do there before it doesn't really make sense with the rest of the explanation that only the people are shrinking and not the ship. Because, you know, the ship has lots of atoms everywhere. And a lot of those atoms are going to be, you know, more than three, you know, you know, you know, a lot of their molecules are going to be more than three atoms in size. Uh, you know, heck, you could even, you know, make an argument that the metal is a sort of, uh, uh, a physical uh, solid plasma sort of structure and uh, uh, sort of some views of, uh, you know, uh, metallurgy. You know. And so you can get this sort of situation where it's like, all right, so the water in your body is only going to shrink so much, if at all. And the rest of your body is shrinking. So all that water, that incompressible water, is going to start creating this pressure that's going to sort of build up and eventually you'll explode. <laughs> oh no. <laughs> I guess they just didn't really um, account for that or they didn't show how much they had to go use the bathroom in between these it's drinking like, scenes. It's like, I do really, all right. Well, maybe that explains like, you know, it's like, all right, this is like a, uh, you know, like an entire episode takes place about over an hour and uh, the but the episode itself is less than thirty minutes. So all the time they're not on screen, they're going to the bathroom. <laughs> this would also mean, of course, that when Kirk returns to his normal size, you know he'll be dehydrated. But <laughs> <laughs> oh no, that's why it took him ten minutes to run three feet to that city. Yes, man, I'm just so tired, and my body feels like it's falling apart because I don't have any water in it. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, and, you know, this is, of course, you know, not getting into all the other sorts of uh, materials and components of the human body that, you know, aren't going to be so easily shrunk as well, because we're not just a pile of DNA. We're, you know, we're a pile of mis a miserable pile of secrets, but we not just a pile of DNA. Uh, and so, yeah, there's a lot of big questions that the explanation for what's going on really doesn't address. So I'm going to say that their explanation doesn't make any sense. And it's, <laughs> you know, even in universe kind of has to be wrong. But spirals. Spirals. <laughs> They're cool, man, I guess. The thing, <sighs> I've never figured this out. I didn't like even, I couldn't even think of a way to like start researching this in any way. Like, what is it with spirals? Why oh, do yeah, people think spirals have some sort of weird special powers? Well, it's like a maze, but just really simple, man. Trying to get to the center of the maze. Just keep going around and around. Yeah. Forever. See, I grew up... I grew up in Arizona. Um, there's a place out there called uh, Sedona. It's just full of magical vortices. Cool. And people go there and enjoy the spiral power. So I was raised around this, like, spirals are magic idea. I don't, uh, I still don't know why spirals are magic. Because they're not a regular shape. Um, <laughs> they, um, they have one beginning, one end, but a very long journey. So it's like life, maybe. Um, <laughs> I don't, I don't really know otherwise. Yeah. Okay. So the physics just doesn't work on this because nothing should shrink like that. Yes. <laughs> I still think, like, earlier we mentioned the thing with, like, I'm pretty sure your your atoms are already as close together as they're going to get. Generally, yeah. Now they're, so you basically have to be, instead of changing the structure of your, your, your molecules, actually reducing the distance between 
you know, your protons and your electrons there. Uh, and so that would re require maybe some sort of artificial reduction in the charges of your particles, though that's generally impossible as under our current understanding of physics, but Star Trek, so maybe there could be something weird going on out there. Um, alternatively, the you could have the you know, you know the fundamental uh, electric, uh, uh, electric constants being altered in some fashion, um, which could result in some sort of weird thing. But that would also shrink. You know, well, that's also going to be in the category of things that's also going to shrink the ship at the same time. Uh, and so to have it be so very specific to biological structures like this, it really kind of becomes difficult to explain in any sort of sensible fashion. Well, they tried to say that like. It was doing something to their DNA, which would, I guess, say that it's just curling your DNA tighter. Mm -hmm. That doesn't make any sense because that's already happened. <laughs> yes. If it's keeping your DNA from uncurling, that just means you can't propagate cells anymore. Yeah. So you're just going to get, uh, you know, going to start getting some necrosis eventually. <laughs> <laughs> it's going to be nasty and it's going to be painful potentially, but you know. <laughs> uh, but. Maybe there's something where it's like using the overall structure of the molecules to induce this reduce, re reduction in internal volume of the atoms somehow, but I'm not quite sure how that follows through at all. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, they imply that it affects your DNA because it's inheritable. Mm -hmm. Otherwise, we're dealing with Lamarckianism. <laughs> So, uh, so, so, so the, the got this inheritable sort of thing going on there. So that means that for some reason, the DNA of the Terratins is fundamentally now permanently different than it is for the, the, the crew who are only temporarily under this effect. And it is a effect that can be, uh, built from the, uh, you know, out of, you know, the, the, the pure materials that are, you know, going to the human body. It just tends to not happen like that. So, you know, independent of their current exposure to the, the stuff, to the radiation there, they're not going to suddenly unravel and become normal sized people anymore. In fact, we you know, witnessed that not being the case in the episode. So it adds another sort of condition onto this situation that is just really hard to explain. Well, so I think this gives us a good chance to talk about this interesting, like, side theory predates a little bit of our modern evolutionary understanding uh not much they were working around the same kind of time period but there's there's this idea called soft inheritance or lamarckianism which was pioneered by john baptiste lamarck and he gets pretty maligned actually because he came up with a dumb evolutionary theory but he was actually a pretty well respected biologist for the time and he came up with a comprehensive idea of biological evolution he just had the motive forces incorrect and his basic idea was that evolution functions by something called soft inheritance or use disuse theory which basically means if an animal has to do something over and over it slightly changes their body and then their descendants have that slight change to their body and continue having to do the thing more and more so basically it's kind of like for giraffes you start with a short necked animal and they have to keep stretching to reach higher leaves and that stretching gets inherited by the next generation which has to stretch more and eventually you get a long neck and so it it really much implies that by doing something that you are actively altering your genetic structure yeah uh, but they didn't really know about genes at the time so they didn't no so he had this like inherited change idea instead of the darwinian idea of uh of um, natural selection based on on driving evolutionary you know uh forces and selection pressures i guess to a certain extent uh, the lamarckianism is sort of a you know an active for changing things while the darwinism is things kind of change on their own and then we have a bunch of filters that sort of select for things yeah the darwinian model is more everything just randomly happens the stuff that really doesn't work gets filtered out and everything else mm -hmm. carries through. Yeah. So I guess here's a kind of a fun question. Well, what would you prefer to have be the true uh, explanation here? See, there's no prefer. Like, <laughs> I don't think there's a prefer. 
like that what what's really interesting with this model with the lamarckian model is it doesn't work for plants mm -hmm. you need to be able to be an active actor on the environment you need to have like you, you need to be able to actively do a thing to the yes. environment in order to change your body. So plants wouldn't really be able to evolve. So you know, it's like, well, we're sitting here. Uh, we're kind of passively taking in stuff from the environment nearby, but that's kind of all we're doing. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, if we're going to be a Labarcanism, uh, uh, this plant here, I guess the way to go forward would be to just become very wide. Also, I really wouldn't want Lamarckianism because it would turn into an old style uh, Bethesda Elder Scrolls game <laughs> where you have to be jumping everywhere because you're like, everyone would just walk down the street jumping every step. It's like, this will make my children stronger. <laughs> Which would be kind of hilarious. My kid will be really good at jumping. <laughs> God. My kid's going to be very good at lifting. My kid's going to be very good at driving. My kid's going to be very good at doing, you know, you know get, becoming better at other things. <laughs> <laughs> My kid's going to be really good at math. I should mention, someone's going to mention this because it's all over the freaking news and science reporting and stuff right now. There is an active debate on whether the idea of epigenetics validates Lamarckianism. I've not been paying attention to this one. <laughs> okay. Epigenetics is the idea that what happens during your lifetime changes your genetics, which we have yeah. demonstrable proof of and can be inherited. But uh, yeah, I, I guess the, 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 the big question is, does that uh, change in your genetics actually cause a Lamarckianism sort of change there? No, it doesn't. But they're saying in some <laughs> ways it may be correct. This is basically like different pressures that you have. Like uh, someone who went through a famine, their epigenetic markers change. And then several generations down the line, their children have slightly altered metabolisms that may be better at dealing with a lack of food. So it's sort of introducing certain elements that are going to be uh, useful, you know, if they are able to be sort of activated down the road. But it is different than our normal understanding of the pure Darwinian model, where all genetic change is random at the point of conception. So oh, I guess to uh, to a certain extent, you know, you know, it's you know, it's not the jumping everywhere. It's if you're going to be starving a lot, it might make it easier not to starve for your great grandchildren. Maybe yes, yes. We've we've demonstrated this theory is correct. <laughs> Epigenetics exists as far as we can tell. I have some criticisms about how we talk about it because it's being used to be kind of a uh, predestination paradox issue. Oh, yeah. Like, well, my grandfather had trauma, so now I'm doomed to depression, which is a problem for how we're kind of dealing with these things uh, internally. Yeah, they're uh, so it's like, well, I, I guess I just can give up and uh, sort of let all these things that have are I'm genetically predisposed to uh, sort of take over, and suddenly we're in Gattaca again. A little. I mean, I don't think it's any individual person giving up. I have problems with the way the system is treating people. Like, I'm not trying to criticize individuals who need yeah. to try to deal with what's happening in their lives. I'm being very critical, and I want to be clear, of the system that is using that as an excuse to not help others. Yeah, yeah. so uh, we're going to uh, do some statistics here and say that you aren't predisposed to this, so we're going to not treat you as a full person anymore. Go away. Yep, to one degree or another, that keeps happening. But we are not... We're not going in to Foucault and how mental illness is used as a way to consolidate institutional power. Uh, I guess there is a uh, also a relationship uh, in this to uh, that old uh, uh, racism thing. Oh, that good old racism. Yeah. Good old timey down home racism. <laughs> I, I, I was, uh, you know, the uh, like in uh, in law and things like that. You got to uh, you know, situations where it's like, all right, so we're going to have to, uh, you know, figure out what damages you're owed. Uh, you know, after you've, you know, you get this uh, case settled here. And uh, because, uh, you know, of your, your family's background and your race and those other things, we're going to uh, cut 30% off your uh, your settlement here because you're not expected to live as long. Ah, uh, yeah. What? <laughs> <laughs> the, 
Maybe maybe that's uh, because you're cutting 30% off of our, our payment here because we're getting no. screwed over. No, nope. it just proves it. No one in your family has lived as long. We gave you less help because you don't live as long and you kept not living as long, therefore validating our decision. Yeah, that's a lot of bullshit there. Yeah, there's a lot but, of this uh, stuff. This. It's, yeah, this is kind of the stuff that, you know, this is where some of these ideas are very easy to uh, abuse and to engage in very bad behavior that is you know, very much sort of a self-fulfilling prophecy uh, in that, well, we're going to have bad bad outcomes because we are, we're using this reasoning. And then, oh, surprise, because we have bad outcomes, we can keep using this use- reasoning. I feel like at some point we're going to have to have a new show called Find the Racism. <laughs> Uh, really, that's kind of every show, honestly. <laughs> it should be, <laughs> but uh, yeah. So that that sucks. Um, so yeah, I guess we. Yeah, it's very very much a case where we have to sort of be careful about how we talk about this because it is a situation where these ideas are very very ripe for abuse by folks that want to maintain their power and uh, you know not give as much money when they're uh, they screw up. So yeah a problem okay we've managed to the depressing moment again we've managed to hit the depressing moment and we somehow rung kicking and screaming 20 minutes of discussion out of this episode yes somehow (laughs) so i think now it's time for the galaxy's favorite game show Hey everybody, uh, uh, the audience is a little small today, but uh, I'll keep talking anyway. Um, so uh, we got uh, our various contestants here. Uh, they're also kind of, I, I'm, I'm losing track of everyone, Gap, when, uh, give me give, give, give me that magnifying glass here. Thank you. <laughs> um, so, uh, all right, everybody, we got our various contestants who've managed to rack up a few uh, points here. Uh, their, their, their point holes are kind of on the small side, but we, we could forgive them on this one here. So uh, we got some prizes to hand out uh, for their uh, great successes here. And so we're going to start off with the Think Small Prize, which goes to the whole crew due to their body shrinking and subsequent we- efforts to deal with the ship's controls. What do they win, Gepwin? They win some dollhouses. There's, there's got to be something on this ship. When I was a kid, some of my favorite books were the Borrowers series. Oh, yeah. There was a lot of cool creativity of the ways that you could use stuff to do things as a small entity and some of at one point they wound up in a tiny train village which was cool so nice now what, what scale is that like a uh, hos uh they weren't clear this is old timey train <laughs> villages oh all right so so it could, could be anybody's uh <laughs> scale at that point oh but yeah I, i'd love to get some uh get some uh, button tables uh how about you I think the real problem here is that in the future, we've eliminated all small detritus. Hmm. So they don't have random junk to find under a table and turn into a tiny car or whatever. So uh, so is that what they're going to get uh, for their prizes? <laughs> yes. Random. They need a, bo- like a random sewing box because it's always what they make things out of in those horrible tiny borrower adaptation movies. <laughs> So uh, a box of knickknacks and uh, string and uh, sewing needles, buttons, other bits of cloth. Excellent, excellent, excellent. Um, uh, I guess you can sort of put it over there. They'll be able to find it eventually. Um, the the second prize is the Wonderful Hostage Prize, which goes to the bridge crew for being super okay with being abducted and proceeding to not really do anything once they're on the planet. You know, like talk to the people in charge and try to sort out what's going on and Maybe, I don't know, tried to make contact with Kirk or something like that. I don't know. What do they win, Gep, when they're being lazy again? Well, they just, they win actual Federation medals because, you know, this is what you're supposed to do. They they got to the thing went, oh, this was all a giant misunderstanding. Let's just party. Oh, all right. Everybody, let's, uh, let's party like it's uh, like we're uh, 1.99 millimeters tall. <laughs> All right, our final prize is the No Hard Feelings Prize, which goes to the Terratons for specifically using their planetary defense mechanism to get help and then kind of being jerks after the fact, but still, you know, like, save us, please. What do they win, Gepwin? They actually win a really good Nobel Peace Prize for having a defense system that is so harmless it can be used literally to just get someone's attention. That's a very good point. 
So uh, maybe maybe we should install these uh, in uh, all sorts of other uh, planetary systems in order to uh, you know make sure that uh, it's like oh this is our ultimate like got to disable somebody or get their attention sort of beam that'd be kind of useful wouldn't it yeah so uh, take it away Terratons uh, d- uh, go and uh, save the galaxy from uh, you know hostile uh, attentions and such uh, as uh, for you Gapwin could you take us away and uh, uh, we're you're, you're kind of small too now. Um, is getting out of hand. Uh, thank you to all of our tiny, tiny contestants for joining us here on the Galaxy's Favorite Game Show! <laughs> Next week is very special. Why is it very special? Because it's our 100th episode... Bum, bum, bum. Too many of these, for being honest. <laughs> too many. <Been> too many. <laughs> too many. I'm so too tired. Much yeah. So uh, are we, are we going to do something fun? Are we going to do something dramatic? Going to be doing something weird? So we're going to do our normal uh, every 10 episodes. If you haven't been around a while, we we switch it up. We do a sci-fi movie. Um, we We did have kind of a, we had like a request a while back to do a specific movie for episode 100 but given the way things are going in the world at the minute it didn't seem like a super appropriate movie for what's happening right now indeed so it's it's on my list to cover later but uh, yeah we will cover it eventually but it did not seem like the proper time so instead i've decided that we're just going to pick what is a very iconic one of the like big well-known best 80s sci-fi movies that's actually way deeper than you think it is moon trap <laughs> yeah moon raker <laughs> uh, next time we are going to be doing the arnold schwarzenegger classic total recall Ooh. i remember seeing this when i was quite young and being like am i allowed to watch this <laughs> <laughs> yeah i actually didn't see this uh for quite a while, because I wasn't allowed to watch violent movies as a child. Well, I had uh, a number of sib- uh, older siblings who didn't really care when the parents were gone. So, <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, this happens when you're an only kid. Your parents pay attention to everything you do. But when, you, when you're uh, number five of six, uh, it's like, ah, uh, do we still have all of them? Good. Okay, that's good enough. It's like all your fingers, <laughs> toes, good. <laughs> Kids, all right, okay. <laughs> um, leave us alone, we need to take a nap. <laughs> So I was wrong. It's not an 80s movie. It's a 1990 movie. Which is close enough. June you know? 1st, 1990. A sunny day in June. Arnold Schwarzenegger swaggered onto Mars. Uh, As so a total recall based on the uh, Philip K. Dick short story of the same name. He keeps copping up in various sci-fi movies. I've he noticed. does. No one ever actually reads the thing. Yes. <laughs> no one ever actually reads the story. They take the title... And two of the, like, initial concepts, and then forget the rest. Yes. I can't blame them in this case. Uh, though I, I guess they didn't do that for Radio Free Abermuth. Ah, uh, yeah. <laughs> or, um, oh, what was that? Speed, no, something, Speed Graffers in anime. Um, help. What was that one? They rotoscoped the whole thing. Oh, um, I had the title in my head a moment ago, but it featured Keanu Reeves and uh, yeah. Robert Downey Jr., uh, Scanner Darkly. Yes, Scanner Darkly. What a horrible, horrible movie. Made me sick. It's <laughs> yeah, it's it's hard to watch, like physically. <laughs> and also, it it probably shows why you should not directly adapt Philip K. Dick. It's pretty weird. Anyway, back to Total Recall. <laughs> yeah, back to Total Recall. Everyone knows what this movie is. Get your get your ass to Mars movie. Mm-hmm. Uh, we're it's going to be fun, and it's actually there's there's a lot more going on than you think which is what it's one yeah. of those cool we snuck some cool stuff going in under the surface style bad 80s action movie sort of things which is great i love it when the <laughs> like like action movie sci-fi action movie starring arnold schwarzenegger ha- is like actually really deeper than a lot of modern sci-fi <laughs> yes <laughs> so there, there's some concepts and ideas to sort of explore here and uh also, give me an opportunity to uh, maybe uh, talk about uh, f- a future colonization of Mars. Yeah, that'd be fun. Yeah. Terraforming. Terraform it. Terraforming all the things. 
Okay, so that's going to do us for this week. Next time, look forward to the good old, not quite the 80s classic, Total Recall. (laughs) Next time on Watchers of Tomorrow, who do you want to be on your summer vacation? You have been listening to Watchers of Tomorrow, a podcast on science fiction media. Find and follow Watchers of Tomorrow on Podbean, YouTube, Spotify, iTunes, Google Play, Stitcher, Pocket Cast, Spreader, Digital Podcasts, and perhaps many more to come. If you enjoy our podcast, make sure to subscribe for more. And where possible, make sure to rate your experience or leave us a review. You may find Gepwin on youtube.com slash Gepwin and Twitter at Gepwin. You may find me, Dr. Isix, on youtube.com slash Dr. Isix and Twitter at IsixLP. Music is Waveform and Mori's Principle, both by DRKRN. You can also check out the Watchers of Tomorrow Discord channel. Make sure to share the experience with your friends, family, enemies, and alien overlords. If you feel you are suffering from transporter syndrome, please be aware that the next time you step off the transporter, that you, that is now, no longer exists. <laughs> <laughs>